Welcome back to uh, part two of our two-part episode on checklist. Uh, I think we got a lot discussed uh, last time, and uh, let's pick it up where we left off, guys. Funny story about checklists um, that occurred to me about uh, about six. No, it's probably been about ten years ago. Um, but uh, in any event, I was flying um, from Salt Lake to Huntsville, Alabama, and my wife asked. Um, if I wouldn't mind taking one of her friends and dropping her off in Atlanta, I said, well, I'm going to Huntsville, but I got to go to Kennedy in Florida after that. Sure. I can drop her off. So she had essentially no experience uh, in flying in small aircraft, never even been in the front seat of any airplane. So it was real early in the morning. We departed and I, I did a, a very thorough briefing to make her comfortable. I told her everything I was doing and I kept referring to my checklist and uh, I've got a personalized checklist that I keep on the, the dash under the whiskey compass. And uh, I was telling her, talking her through everything we're doing all the way down. Two hops, went into Huntsville, one did a meeting and then into Atlanta, dropped her off and then I went on to Florida. A couple of weeks later, she comes home by the airlines and, and my wife asked her, so how was it? She said, well, it was, it was really pretty good. But why does he keep opening that and reading that book? I thought he knew how to fly this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, as you see on the screen there, my wife's comment was, Michelle, my advice to you is if you ever get in a plane and the pilot doesn't use the checklist, get out. Um, so I wrote a little story about that in Sport Aviation for EAA back in 2017. And uh, just uh, it kind of it hits home as to how important it is uh, to be using checklists um, and making sure we're doing the right thing because uh, Kirk uh, Samuelson shared a story with me about someone he flew with that didn't use a checklist at all. And uh, this is a, he said this was an individual that was part of a Part 91 uh, flight department uh, for a company. And uh, it was a CJ2 Plus, and Kirk got a chance to go fly with him just by happenstance. Uh, and uh, the guy probably had about 15,000 hours, a good six, seven, 8,000 hours in citations. He was obviously very proficient, flying 500 hours an hour, a year doing long days uh, because he was pre-positioning airplanes and then he was getting home and then he was going out and flying legs. Really long days, but he was so proficient that he'd never used the checklist. And he would get started and within two minutes of start, he is taxiing to the runway. Um, and um, Kirk tried in the right seat to, you know, kind of pace with the checklist and follow along and he pretty much just ignored all that. So. When the flight was over, Kirk had a nice long talk with him about the discipline of checklists and the needs for it and the, the need to be cognizant of duty day and all kinds of things. Well, think about um, what you're doing and setting yourself up. There's a number of issues with operating without a checklist. Why was he doing it? Speed, save time, he knows this stuff. Um, those are all good excuses and rationale for getting yourself into trouble uh, when you don't need to. Um, we like to say that slow is the new fast because if you miss something and we're going to talk about this there are critical space uh, areas and spots in a checklist that i call points of no return where if you don't have everything done up to that point and you take the next step you could get yourself in a lot of trouble so checklists get you on a right pace and they make sure you're ready for that next critical phase of flight and uh, the one or two minutes that he thinks he's saving or the three or four or five minutes he thinks he's saving it's often a self-imposed uh, criteria, thinking that the passengers are going to be, you know, um, not happy with taking too long to get to the runway or taking, you know, sitting there with the engines running before they taxi. You just need to brief your, your passengers on what to expect and make sure that the pace is going to enable you to go by checklist so you don't make mistakes. So very important lessons there. And a couple of extreme examples, right? I, I don't ever do anything without at least referring back to the checklist. And we'll talk about different techniques for using them. All right, final case. This was an actual accident that happened down in Florida. Uh, this was another CJ3 um, and happened a little over a decade ago. And the setup is the plane was flown by a, a charter operation and it was down in Stewart, Florida for a few days. And before the plane was going to return, uh, I don't recall where to, the first officer went out to the airplane a couple days ahead of time because they had a database update on the FMS to do. So they didn't get a GPU. They wanted to minimize the drain on the battery. So they pulled the brake circuit breaker to keep the hydraulic motor from uh, constantly cycling. 
Of course, you can see the setup here. They forgot to put the circuit breaker back in for the hydraulic pump for the brakes. So two days later, they go to fly their trip and they missed the circuit breaker. Okay, so this is another example of it's on the checklist. So one of two things happened. The pilot either didn't use the checklist for the cockpit cabin inspection or what we just talked about, they used the checklist, but again, gave it lip service. They said circuit breakers in, they gave it a quick glance. We all know it's very difficult to see the circuit breakers in a lot of our airplanes. Some of our airplanes are a little better set up than others. The 525s actually have a little better visibility than a lot of other jets in terms of where the breaker is, uh, panel is positioned. But even so, if you just give it a quick glance, uh, it's very easy for a circuit breaker that's out to look like it's in if you're not really giving it the time to look at each row and, and spend a few seconds on it. So the pilots missed that the circuit breaker was out for the, the hydraulic pump for the brakes. They had one more chance to save this though. So they start up the engines and they had to make a right turn to join the taxiway. Uh, the pilot made a comment about the brakes. They were taxiing towards, if I remember right, a King Air and they realized they didn't have any brakes and they taxied into the King Air. Um, they never use the emergency brake. Okay. So again, another chance here is in the Textron checklist, the first step on the taxi checklist is to check your brakes. Okay. Right there. It says very first thing you do as you start taxiing is check your brakes. And if you don't have braking, then use the emergency brake. So in the official checklist, it's right there priming you for this situation. And I like to just make a little aside here that when I conduct private pilot check rides, we use the airman certification standards as replaced the PTS many of us were familiar with. So the ACS says very clearly that one of the things I have to evaluate a want to uh, be private pilot on is when they start taxing towards the bottom of the screen, do they perform a brake check immediately after the airplane begins moving? If they don't do this, they haven't passed the taxiing task. If they don't pass the taxiing task, they don't pass the private pilot check ride. So this is something that the FAA makes clear from the very first check ride we ever take, they expect, is the second the airplane starts moving, we perform a brake check. Because it's a lot easier to stop the airplane from one or two knots than it is from 15 knots if we've accelerated a bit on the taxi. So again, a couple opportunities where the checklist could have saved them. Uh, and then as well, an opportunity where just good habits could have saved them. Uh, the final point I want to talk about is I do see a lot of, of what I would say are, are non-optimal checklist strategies, not using flow patterns. I think that's something Charlie's going to talk about a little bit as well. Um, we want to use the checklist in the proper way. There are situations where using the checklist as a do list might actually be optimal. We read the checklist and we go through it and we do the items as we read through it. But most of the time, the checklist really is supposed to be a checklist. It's supposed to be checking that we have already accomplished something. And when we use a flow pattern, the advantage is we have two chances to make sure something critical is done. So for example, uh, the after start flow in a 510, if we do the after start sequences as a flow, we might say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn my AC and fans on. I'm going to do my uh, air source check, check for my glare shield fans, come over, set up my ice, my passenger safety switch, set my flaps, my, do my speed brake test, make sure the trim is checked, my flight controls are checked. If I memorize this and I do this as a flow, meaning a specific memorized step of actions, okay, that's my first chance to make sure critical things are done. All right, I've, I've now had one opportunity to make sure that the flaps are properly set for takeoff, that the trim is properly set for takeoff. Now, if I follow that up with reading the checklist as a checklist, not as a do list, then I now have a second chance. I have some redundancy that I, in fact, set my flaps, that I, in fact, have checked that my speed brakes and my trim uh, operate properly. If I read through my checklist as a do list, I have one opportunity for all of these critical items. And if I get distracted and I skip over the flap set step, for example, I might end up doing a flap zero takeoff with flaps 15 uh, takeoff speeds, which on a short runway uh, could potentially be life-threatening. Fantastic information and really great graphics. A uh, couple of things I wanted to show really quickly, uh, some things that our CJP members have actually done in regard to checklist. One is, here's a picture of uh, a checklist has been developed by Ted Rosenberger for the Mustang that can be displayed on the MFD for uh, NXI uh, optioned uh, G1000 airplanes. Really cool. He's put a lot of effort into that. 
And here's another example of a checklist that uh, my friend Larry King uses on his M2, where he has put tons of information, laminated it on a two-sided checklist, the kind of thing you were talking about, Neil, uh, that uh, makes it easier for him in, in the cockpit. Charlie, you want to talk a little bit more about specific use, how you use checklists? Um, sure, David, thanks. I'll pick up right where Neil left off with a few more thoughts and tips and some sure. ideas. Um, this is uh, just kind of some uh, additional tips that I think we can all uh, apply here. There's different methods of using the checklist for different situations. And number one is run a flow and then come back and read the items. Use logical breakpoints. That's what Neil just showed us, really great examples. Um, if you are flying with a partner or you do crude activities, in that return to reading the items after the fact, you can do challenge and response. One, uh, the crew member not flying can read the item and the crew member flying can, can pare back the answer. And so the checklists are set up with the item on one side and the place to put it on the other side of the page, right? Um, and so a challenge and response uh, uh, approach is also appropriate in certain uh, conditions. And I use with my wife flying with me, she's not a rated pilot, but she's flown with me enough, she knows kind of the flows and she knows what I should be doing. So I have her do challenge and response with me. And uh, I know CJP has been working on a companion uh, training program and getting your companion engaged in the cockpit is always a good thing. Second set of eyes, uh, even if, if they're not fully capable of flying the airplane, they certainly can learn to run checklists with you. The other one, obviously, is the memory items. Uh, there's no time to open your book and, and uh, on an engine take takeoff with a V1 uh, continue uh, to, to pull the checklist out. That's something you pull out later. So you got to run the memory items and you got to have um, – uh, those things done and committed to memory. And I think I've noticed in my own uh, flying, uh, one thing that helps there is I actually have a sheet that I wrote out that has all of the, the memory item uh, titles with blanks under it. And once a week, I sit down and I write in the blanks and I make sure that I can do the memory items. Um, and you know, I get to the end of the runway and one of my pre-takeoff briefings is to recite out loud the memory items for V1 cut with a board and a V1 cut with a continue, and it's fresh in my mind right there because I'm not going to be able to pull the checklist out. Uh, then there's a thing that I call the points of no return, right? And so Neil pointed one out. It's that that uh, a checklist that says uh, check the brakes immediately after you start rolling. Well, we're not actually supposed to have the checklist out while the airplane is moving, right? So when do you need to read that checklist? Right before you start taxiing. And that's a point of no return. So before you do something that could be something you can't take back, like letting the airplane roll um, when you don't have brakes, you should have read that checklist ahead of time. It would have reminded you, if this happens to me, I'm going for the emergency brake handle and I'm checking the brakes early. Um, so there are points of no return, like when you first start taxiing, like when you hit the start button on an engine start. You don't have everything right. You could have to be setting yourself up uh, for a, for a bad start and damage to your airplane. Uh, and then as I showed you, um, the sequences in the steps can be critical in certain cases, following the flow of the checklist per the OEM and not bouncing around. So if you're one of those that has made something up and, and it's comfortable to you and it's different than the flow that the OEM has, you better sit down and run through that again and, and make sure that you're not setting yourself up for unintended consequences. And then the other thing I'll, I'll piggyback on, uh, Neil showed the checklist where the fine print uh, is a one pager. This is an awkward, this is my CJ3 checklist. It's awkward, it's bulk, bulky. The other thing about their, their one page simplified checklist is it starts with the before starting engines checklist. So the cockpit configuration prior to that is not in this. Um, so what I did, I didn't do, uh, I did a little bit different than what Neil pointed out with the uh, of one page both sides. I went to Kinko's and I had a book like this done and like I said it sits up under my map, uh, my uh, compass and it's always handy and I've got a page for each phase of flight if you will and uh, I'm going to show you a couple of those um, here in a second um, but it's right there and it's handy and it's easy, the print's large and it's in a nice flow but the other thing we have an advantage of when we can make our own checklist is we can actually insert things that 
are appropriate to us that the manufacturer might not have put in there. I'll give you a couple examples of that. So it may feel like checklists are slowing you down, but slow is the new fast, everybody. I think you need to recognize that you're going to wish you'd had uh, taken a little extra time if you're the guy that runs your airplane into another on the taxiway because you didn't check your brakes. And avoiding mistakes will save time in the long run, and checklist pace is going to set you up for success. Um, so let me give you a few examples out of, um, out of making your own checklist. Can you? Uh, the answer is yes, but there are a few things to consider. Uh, if you're operating under Part 91 of the FAR, uh, you can create your checklist on your own, provided that it contain each element that's published in the POH. Um, segmenting the checklist really helps. Before takeoff, there's a laundry list, and then there's a natural break, and then there's the before takeoff final items. So it, as you build this, set it up with natural pauses that are logical, that uh, make it easier for you. It takes some time to think through this, um, and then, um, you know, the citation POH checklist, the long, long form in the book is obviously okay to use, but like we pointed out, it's really, really awkward, thick, heavy, and a lot of pages. And the short form on the back, as we said, small print and no pre-start stuff. Um, so here's, here's a few pages out of mine. Um, and uh, so this is my cover, as I showed you here a bit ago from what I did. I just went down to Kinko's and they, they bound it for me. It's really simple. Um, but, you know, the passenger brief for when I put family in the airplane, this stuff's not necessarily in uh, the OEM's checklist. So there it is in the front. I don't miss things to tell them, um, you know, the things they need to know. The other thing I did was I added some things in the starting engine checklist. I remind myself of the max tailwind and crosswind limits. And then I also remind myself, you know, um, Neil and I talk about the iPhony check, you know, Ignition, fuel flow, oil pressure, N1, and ITT. Um, you know, and so I just kind of write this out here. If I haven't flown in a couple, three weeks, you know, that may have left me. So I read through this before I hit the start button. This is another point of no return. And I remind myself if I have to shut down because I don't get a light off, I want to windmill for 15 seconds and then start disengage press. And if that still stays on, there's a major power down you got to go through. We, you know, we don't have time to pull the book out if this failure happens to us during a start. We've got to have this fresh in our mind. So I put that in because it's a, another example of a point of no return. The other thing I did was I recognized that, you know, we have um, takeoff, after takeoff check, and we have a climb check and, and you know, pass an 18,000, we have a, a, a top of climb and a before descent and approach check. I put in a couple of other things. Um, has anybody ever gotten to that point where you're five minutes after takeoff and you realize you haven't come out of, brought it out of um, takeoff power yet and gone to MCT? I don't ever want to be there. I almost did one time because I had essentially a cleared climb all the way to 18,000. Um, no problem with the altitudes, but after as soon as I took off, they started arguing between tower and approach evidently about a hut. Uh, restricted area and they wanted me on a different route and so I'm talking to them about what route they wanted me on they changed it a couple of times and I was beyond three minutes still in takeoff power because I was on an unrestricted climb so what do I do now at the end of this checklist after landing I have a, an item in there that says set chronograph um, I have the chronometer on the panel and I set it for a three minute alarm and as I hit three minutes after takeoff and it's set at the end of a flight so it's ready to go to the next flight it flashes at me three minutes and that reminds me to check the throttles. I'm a single pilot. I don't have another guy over there reminding me to pull the throttles out of takeoff, right? Most of the time, that's not an issue, but you don't want to put yourself in a, a real engine problem maintenance issue if you forget to do that. The other thing I've added in, in mind going uphill is I've added um, some uh, uh, before takeoff items that, that I like to read to remind myself that are not in the OEM. I remind myself that on the radar altimeter, readout, which is right in the PFD, that I don't want to be turning my autopilot on before 240 for this airplane. First turn IFR is 400 AGL. It's right there in the middle of the PFD. And then I remind myself that if I've got a low first level off, I'm going to go CWS and pitch down to lower that climb rate. And uh, I'm, I'm going to remind myself that a 200 feet per mile gradient is 600 feet per minute. That's just what I'm going to want to see at 180 knots. And then I also remind myself for one engine and off, remember to go Phelps and V2 after gear up. Those are things, steps that I would forget if I don't remind myself right before they happen, right? 
Um, so this is kind of the laundry list stuff. And then these are the final checks right before you take the runway, right? There's a pacing here and a natural split. The other thing I do is um, I've inserted into this checklist. I'm not going to show the page, but you get the idea. Um, I have an 18,000 foot check where I check the landing lights go to off instead of instead of uh, strobe. And, um, and I also check my masks again at that point. And, um, and then at passing 25,000, I have a checklist item that reminds me to, if I've had my tail D ice on to turn them off because at 25,000, you're getting pretty close to that min temperature on most days. I do the same thing on the, on the way down. So there's lots of things you can add that keep yourself out of trouble for some of the ops limits in the plane that our OEM didn't put into the POH. It's just like NASA. They put that, that dang abort checklist at three hours prior to launch. We've gone through seven or eight pages since then. And who's to remember to go back in the heat of the moment to find that? We were lucky to have one guy that did. So um, there's just some tips for you. It takes a little bit of effort. To, uh, to get to a point where um, the checklist is, is doing those things that you want to make sure you don't forget when you take advantage of, of tailoring your own checklist. But remember to make sure you include all the minimums from the OEM. Wow. Lots of information, Charlie. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Neil, something that Charlie mentioned about flying single pilot and brake checking and that kind of stuff, can you talk about the challenge we – have as single pilots in running checklists while we're taxiing down the runway, copying clearances. I mean, what are the what are the gotchas that we need to think about when we're trying to do too many things multitask at one at the same time? Uh, David, that's a great question, and the SOPs that Charlie and I uh, wrote speak to this very point. So, in surface operations, we have a recommendation that. Uh, during all surface movement, all taxing, the pilot has the attention focused on taxing, should only perform checklists and briefings with the aircraft stopped. Uh, and then of course, not to conduct unnecessary conversation during taxi. So uh, I, I strongly encourage pilots in a single pilot situation, especially to run the checklists only when stopped uh, and to do the briefings only when stopped. Um, I also fly a two pilot airplane and the takeoff briefing for this airplane uh, can run somewhat lengthy. You know, we're talking about return to landings and with certain hydraulic control issues, we might have to divert to a 10,000 foot runway. So we're including in a briefing where the closest big runway is. Well, I do that before we start taxiing. You know, there's, there's no time pressure in the world, right? You're not blocking access to the runway. You're not distracted by anything else. So it's the pretty much the last thing we do right before we start taxiing and call for taxi so that we can really take our time. We can be focused. If the other pilot has a question on it, we can discuss it. If I miss something, he wants to bring something up. So in a single pilot situation, I would say even more so because it's even more critical to not be trying to do any briefing or checklist while you're taxiing when, when you're the only uh, show really. So, um, you know, there's sometimes this artificial time pressure we impose on ourselves that when we get to the runway, we have to be ready for takeoff right away. Sometimes ATC piles on that. I can tell you it's not real. There's absolutely no harm if for 15 seconds you set the parking brake holding short of the runway and read your last few items rather than trying to do it while you're taxing. That's, that's great input. Um, Charlie, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I just uh, echo everything he said, and I would I would also add that what we did in the military is we did very detailed briefings before we ever left the squadron operating area, and such that when you got into the airplane, the briefing that you had to do, like at the end of the runway, was a was a canned quick refresher of what you'd already spent a lot of time going through in detail. So I have a habit of running through my pre-takeoff briefing, especially if I'm flying with someone, I do it before engines start. So the engines aren't running. I don't have that artificial pressure. I, I got fuel flow running. I want to get to the end of the runway. I take all that pressure off. It's all self-induced anyway. But a way to take it off is just to do all this stuff early. That takeoff briefing we put in the in-flight guide, I go to that and I brief it in detail. And then when I get to the end of the runway, I go through a much abbreviated but hitting the, the specifics of the departure I'm about to fly, my autopilot plan, my 
memory items one last time. And it, it flows a lot quicker and you don't need more than, you know, like Neil said, 15 to 30 seconds. You take all that pressure off, especially if you're going into a strange field that has lots of traffic, getting ahead of things and, uh, and, and, and taking that pressure off is really important. Great. Uh, that's fantastic information, guys. Those of you who just heard Charlie talk in tremendous depth about his checklist, I, it's unbelievable the amount of data he goes. Neil, you've flown with Charlie, haven't you? I have, David. Yeah, well, I have too. So for those of you normal pilots, let me tell you a little story about flying with Charlie. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in um, Houston at Hobby, and back on the way back to Dallas, Addison, and uh, in my Mustang, and Charlie says, uh, hey, can I hitch a ride with you going back to Dallas? I said, oh, absolutely. So Charlie gets in the right seat, and he says, so do you mind if I fly? No, I have, no, great. Astronaut flying my airplane. This would be cool. Well, he hand flies all the way back to Dallas. He never engages the autopilot, of course. Uh, and we're below RBSM, so everything's legal. Uh, and about 10 minutes into the flight, we're, we're level. And Charlie says, uh, he says, do you mind if I uh, reset your trim? And I said, what do you mean reset my trim? I've had this airplane for a year. It's trimmed down. He said, no, it's, it's not. It's, it's out of trim. So I said, sure. Okay, fine. So he reaches down to the trim selector and he just goes up boop, like a millisecond because it wasn't absolutely perfect. So then I, you know, I, okay, fine. He's got it trimmed the way Charlie Precourt likes to have it trimmed. Well, we're on approach in Addison. The weather's good. And Charlie says, do you mind if I make the landing? No, not, no, not at all. I'm sure he's only landed a Mustang once in his life, right? Of course. So I'm, you know, it's, it's going to be not going to be a very good landing and I'll, I'll look good. Right. So it's one of those landings, I've been flying for 50 years. It's, it's, it's one of those landings that happens for me about every 10 years. You know, the one where you land and you can't actually feel the wheels touch? You know you've landed because you can see things flying by you, but you don't actually feel the touchdown. Of course, that's Charlie's landing from the right seat in the Mustang. And by this time, I'm, I'm pretty upset. I'm just, I've, I've had it with Charlie Precourt. I don't do anything, though I'm professional. We pull off the uh, runway, we're on the taxiway, and I just reach over and touch him on the shoulder, and I just I say, Charlie, don't worry. If you practice each time, it's, those landings are going to get a little bit better. <laughs> and we taxied off, and that was the last time I flew with Charlie Precourt. So at the risk of sounding like an old couple that remembers stories differently, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's a great, great information, guys. And one thing that Charlie mentioned is about using our companions. Uh, that is a whole nother topic that has that 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 uh, deserves a complete video safety podcast. So look forward in the future to uh, some in-depth talk about how we can effectively use our companions in the cockpit to make our flying safer. So uh, before we uh, exit here, uh, Neil, any final comments? Yeah, I would just really like to emphasize to people that you have to remember we don't use the checklist for when everything's going well, right? And so it's easy to feel complacent after a long time and to really feel like, I know this plane so well, I do my flows from memory, I, you know, I can skip these steps. Um, but the checklist is really for that maybe one time in 500 that you forget, forget to bring the flaps up, you know, or that you forget to set the flaps for takeoff. Uh, the accident history is replete with these accidents. Where I live up in Boston, there was a tragic uh, Gulfstream accident a few years ago where the flight controls were never unlocked. The crew had gotten out of the habit of doing a flight control check, and they had, in the previous 100 uh, takeoffs that were available on the flight data recorder, 97 cases not done a flight control check. Well, in 99 of the last 100 takeoffs, the flight controls were unlocked, but tragically on this takeoff, the flight controls were locked. They weren't able to rotate and everybody on board perished in a fire. So really we have to remember, this is not for when we're at our best. This is for when we have that one time in 100, one time in 500 that we've forgotten something critical that we're running these checklists. Uh, I also, in conclusion, I wanna talk about, you know, Charlie's idea, the three minute timer, I think is a fantastic idea. You're giving yourself a couple minutes margin before you run out of time. Uh, and I could really see the value in that. This is the first time I'm, I'm hearing uh, Charlie talk about that. And I, I love that idea. 
uh, one of the hardest things to do is to remember to remember something in the future. That's, it's called proscriptive memory. And I think we've probably all been in the situation where uh, approach control says at the outer marker, switch to tower. And all of a sudden you're on a one mile final and realize you never switched, right? Because you have to remember to remember something. It's not, there's not something immediately cueing you to do something now. Uh, or, you know, report a three mile final uh, when you check in 10 miles out and you're thinking about a million other things and you don't remember to remember to report a three mile final. Uh, and, and this is exactly what this timer is setting up for. And I'll, I'll just tell a quick story, uh, a little mea culpa here. I was in a CJ2 departing from an airport where because of airspace, the tower was closed. We had to take off and we had to basically immediately after liftoff, make a, a pretty hard 180 degree turn to avoid a restricted area or a TFR is uh, over a decade ago. I can't remember right now. Uh, so we briefed, we said, well, we're going to be basically positive rate gear up. And we're not going to wait to 400 feet. So once we get to, you know, 100, 200 feet, we're going to make a 25 degree bank to the left, you know, turn to this heading. And we briefed, we're going to keep the flaps in the takeoff setting uh, because we're going to be making this bank at low altitude. We're not going to be bringing the flaps up and we'll bring the flaps up when we're out of the turn rolled out on this new heading accelerating. We're going to make the turn at V2 plus 20 to keep the radius small, et cetera. Uh, well, you can probably imagine what happened, right? We take off. We're very focused on making this turn tight to avoid the airspace. We roll out on the heading. We're now contacting approach control. We never ran the after takeoff checklist. And this was in a two pilot situation, but we were really task saturated with that sort of non-normal situation. We forgot to run the climb checklist for a bit. And then we realized after we checked in, we still had the flaps at 15. And we were now over the flap extension speed for flaps being at 15 because we had gotten saturated with this very non-standard departure. Uh, so this idea of setting a timer really could save you in a bunch of situations, not with just with the takeoff thrust, but hopefully by three minutes after takeoff, things are starting to settle down a little bit. And that might be a good cue. Hey, did you actually remember to run the after takeoff checklist or were you so busy with your departure and turns and level offs that, that maybe you haven't gotten to that point yet? So that's a great one, Charlie. I think that's a really good tool to add to the toolbox. That's a great thought, Neil. Uh, it can be a life or death situation using your checklist and correctly using the checklist. Charlie, any final comments? Yeah, I think many in the uh, community have heard me talk about normalization of deviance. And if you're not, if you get into a habit that grows over time that you're not using the checklist, that's essentially what you're uh, doing. And like Neil just said, with uh, the Bedford accident, um, they never had any consequence for what they ended up doing, which was wrong. Um, and had they not deviated from the standard, they would have caught themselves. And so they normalized a deviant behavior, not will willingly wanting to bring an accident on themselves, certainly, but because of a lack of consequence for so many times that they got away with it, it felt normal and it felt okay until it's not okay. So we've got a huge engineering background, um, you know, backstop, if you will, to the airplanes we fly. And we have to take advantage of the engineering that went into those POHs and, and the sequences of the steps. And um, as Neil said, running flows and then coming back and deliberately uh, reading through the checklist to remind ourselves of what we were looking for and to deliberately look at things, not just the flap handle and not the flap indicator. There's so many things in there that can keep us out of trouble if we, we adhere to that discipline and don't get subject to a normalization of deviance. That's really good, Charlie. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this information. We hope we've provided a little bit of uh, safety information that'll make you fly safer. As we tell our members at, at CJP, we're not here to tell you how to fly your airplane. We're just here to give you some things to think about when you do. So until next time, guys, fly safe. CJP Safety and Education Foundation is committed to providing all pilots with the best tools to safely operate their airplane. Our content is always free of charge and you can access it by clicking on the safety tab on our website. Until next time, fly safe.